think we'll start off this morning with a question about the CPI report that came out last week. It showed that inflation is slowing a bit. And so I'm wondering, how strong now do you think the case is for downshifting at the December meeting to something more like a 50 basis point cut? Yeah, so I think um, the uh, most recent CPI inflation print um, suggests that maybe uh, the core PCE measure that we really focus on might be also um, showing a little bit of a reduction um, when we get those, uh, those October numbers later um, this month, maybe from about uh, 0.5 monthly, month over month, in August and September, maybe down to 0.3. Um, and that would be uh, welcome. Um, I think the inflation data was reassuring preliminarily, just in terms of showing a slowing in categories that I had been anticipating. So if you kind of uh, pull it apart, um, you know, obviously food and energy, that reflects um, the war, uh, Mr. Putin, um, and some weather issues. So um, we really are focused on those core numbers. Within core, we're finally starting to see goods inflation starting to turn over. And that is consistent with the data that we've seen on lower uh, shipping times, um, more uh, availability of automotive semiconductors, for instance, wholesale prices on used cars turning over, um, and just generally uh, starting to see those goods prices turning down. And that's a really important trend that will need to continue over the next year if we're going to see overall de disinflation. Within services, though, core services, housing remains quite strong. It's going to take probably well until next year until we start to see those new um, lease numbers starting to filter through to the average housing services. And then on non-housing core services, that's where you're seeing um, people moving their uh, demand, which had been very strongly in goods, over to you know, uh, leisure and hospitality, restaurants, hotels their wages are going to be more important over time. And that's where um, the labor uh, demand supply imbalances have been the greatest. And there, too, we are starting to see the sort of um, wage series, whether you look at the ECI or average hourly earnings on a quarter by quarter, they are stepping down. But that's going to take time. So I'm happy to turn next to uh, what that means for policy. Is that? Yes, yeah. exactly. Do you think the downshift is coming? Yeah. So. Um, I think it will probably um, be appropriate um, uh, soon um, to move to a slower pace of increases. But I think what's really important to emphasize, we've done a lot, but we have additional work to do both on raising rates and sustaining restraint to bring inflation down to 2% uh, over time. So, you know, we have uh, raised uh, rates very rapidly by nearly four, base, uh, four percentage points over about nine months, and we've been reducing the balance sheet. And you can see that in financial conditions. Um, you can see it in inflation expectations, which are quite well anchored. Um, you can see it in interest rate uh, sensitive sectors. But as we said last meeting, um, they're likely to be lags, um, and it's going to take some time for that cumulative tightening. To, uh, to flow through. And so it makes sense to move to a more, um, a more deliberate and a more data-dependent uh, pace uh, as we continue uh, to uh, make sure that there's restraint that will bring inflation down over time. So we were just talking about the size of the interest rate hikes that you've been doing. But another thing that Fed Chair Powell brought up in his latest press conference was where we'll end up, that peak. And he was essentially saying that he thinks we'll end up at a higher peak than people may have originally thought. Do you agree with that? And if we end up at a higher peak, does it mean that we'll hold there for a shorter amount of time? Yeah, so um, these are uh, issues that are questions that are very much going to be informed uh, by the flow of data. Um, so, you know, even um, for just the December meeting's decision, uh, we still uh, will have additional data in hand by the time um, that we will, members of the committee will be submitting their new projections. Um, and of course, uh, those projections are going to reflect uh, that uh, data both on inflation as well as on the labor market activity more generally. 
Um, but it is the case uh, that we do have additional work to do on raising rates, and um, that uh, by uh, moving forward at a pace uh, that's more deliberate, we'll be able to assess um, more data um, and uh, uh, be better able to um, adjust uh, the path of rates uh, to bring inflation down. So, so much of what we wrote about here at Bloomberg during the pandemic and, and elsewhere, I know other journalists too, was about people getting back into the labor market and getting jobs. But now it seems like because inflation is so high, we're now starting to talk about potentially people losing their jobs and moving into a recessionary period. We've been seeing headlines even just this morning about job losses in tech, for example. Bloomberg Economics actually is forecasting a 100% chance of a recession in the next 12 months. What is your forecast for where we end up in terms of unemployment by the end of next year? Yeah, so I think um, it's, it's very difficult um, to give firm projections uh, because this is a very unusual labor market. So the pandemic uh, led to um, a lot of departures from in-person services in particular. And if you look at hiring data, you can still see pretty healthy hiring um, in some of those in-person services where um, some uh, businesses are still trying to catch up um, to uh, levels of employment that may be appropriate for um, the kind of the run rate that they're seeing. Um, but it is the case that as rates uh, move uh, further into restrictive territory, you know, and financial conditions uh, remain tight, that does exert some uh, restraint on demand. Um, to bring demand into better alignment with supply. And so you will see some reallocation. Now, vacancies are unusually high relative to uh, unemployment. And that does suggest, for the reasons um, that we were just talking about, this sort of catch-up hiring, there's some chance that we'll see more of a diminution in those vacancies rather than putting as much emphasis on layoffs. But it's likely there'll be a combination of both. Um, and so we'll just be watching the labor market as well as inflation very carefully uh, as we go forward. So I want to turn to another big story that uh, we've been covering, which is the implosion of another firm in the crypto market, FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried's empire there. And in a speech in July, you were looking at the crypto market and at that time thought that you know, there weren't signs that there was so much interconnectivity yet between crypto firms and the broader financial market to imply a systemic risk. How has your view changed given what's happened in the past week? Yeah, so I, I don't think my view um, has fundamentally changed. First of all, you know, it is um, really concerning to see that retail investors are really getting hurt by these losses. Um, and. It is also the case um, that despite a lot of hype, um, you know, you heard a lot about how decentralized these markets are and how innovative and different. Um, it turns out, you know, they're highly concentrated, highly interconnected, um, and you're just seeing um, a domino effect. Um, failures from one platform or one firm spilling over elsewhere, and it reinforces, I think, um, this need to make sure um, that uh, crypto finance, because it is no different than traditional finance in the risks that it exposes investors to, needs to be under the regulatory perimeter. And it's precisely these issues of interconnectedness, leverage, uh, liquidity, uh, that uh, are traditional financial risks and uh, consumer protection, retail protection, we really need to make sure that that environment has uh, the appropriate regulatory guardrails, whether that means bringing some into compliance with existing rules or in some cases um, expanding that regulatory perimeter. But in order for the innovation um, that uh, is in some of those um, platforms to actually make a positive contribution, there need to be strong regulatory guardrails that assure that like risks are subject to like disclosures and like regulatory outcomes. 
So you were just talking a lot about risk, turning from risk in, in something more narrow, even though interconnected, like the crypto market, going way broad in terms of the world risks. You worked at Treasury before the Fed with a focus on international affairs. We're seeing a lot of fracturing right now between countries like China, Russia, the US and West. Um, lots of pressure on food prices and energy prices for people around the world. And the strength of the dollar is pressuring particularly some developing countries. How much of a risk do you think there is that that pressure, that strength of the dollar and those forces could boomerang back to something that hurts the US economically? Yeah, so I think um, uh, there are uh, clearly uh, complicated geostrategic risks. Um, there are risks associated with very high inflation around most of the world economy and the need um, for rapid tightening to address that. Um, that creates spillovers um, between uh, different economies. Um, and you're seeing that in um, financial market reaction. So, you know, in a highly uh, uncertain environment uh, with high volatility, um, it leads to the need for rapid adjustments. Um, and that can sometimes strain liquidity um, in core funding markets. And that can also sometimes reveal pockets of hidden leverage that maybe uh, were not so apparent to other market participants or even uh, in some cases to regulators. So we are um, very focused on potential spillovers. I think we're highly cognizant that in a world where many large central banks um, or central banks in large jurisdictions are tightening at the same time, um, that that is uh, greater than the sum of its parts. Um, in the case of the US, it reinforces the tightening that we're doing here because uh, not only do we see it in terms of reduced demand uh, for our products abroad ultimately, um, but we also see it through spillovers of tighter financial conditions and uh, through the dollar. Um, but for other countries, um, spillovers uh, may also create some real risks. Um, for instance, those, as you were mentioning, who might be commodity importers or those um, subject to exchange rate risk both in their trade balance but also in um, their, uh, the mismatch between uh, assets and liabilities. So we're, we're on, the, on the lookout, um, very vigilant about potential global risks. You know, we have corporate earnings starting to roll in again, even this week. You know, we have the holidays coming up with large retailers. A lot of people have been focused, and you mentioned, about wages rising and wage inflation. But my colleague Craig Torres actually pointed out to me that you've also been looking at and noted in some of your speeches the issue of corporate profits, markups that firms have done, and how much that, how much wiggle room there is for that, a reduction there. What are you seeing in the data in terms of uh, inventory stock ups, like potential for markups to actually bring some of this inflation down? Yeah, so I think um, you know the data um, is not uh, is not comprehensive, but certainly in retail sectors, um, you can look at retail margins um, relative to how much um, wages have been growing in um, that retail activity. Um, and you can look at uh, that markup um, and how it compares with inventory to sales ratio. So normally, as inventory to sales ratios increase, um, you'd actually expect um, more competitive pressure to start bringing those markups down. That's particularly true when consumers are price sensitive. That process has led to, first of all, very high retail markups, you know, in some cases, um, many times uh, the increase in the average hourly earnings um, in that sector. Um, and now that inventory sales ratios are improving and getting back to pre-pandemic levels, in some cases even above them, it's been slow to sort of see that markup coming back down. But it's a process that you would expect at this point in the cycle. Um, so I'm certainly um, you know, looking at that closely. And of course, that would contribute um, to disinflation in those sectors. I want to turn for a moment to the Fed as an institution itself. In, there's been a lot of questions of late in terms of whether or not the Fed um, was too late in turning to inflation. That's why we're in the situation that we are now. But we've also seen some questions about trading among some of the Fed policymakers from their personal accounts. How much damage do you think has been done to the Fed's credibility over the past few years? 
Yeah, so look, I think um, that first of all, um, in those cases where our rules um, were not uh, clear enough or where there were inconsistencies um, with stronger rules at the board than at the reserve banks, even though we're all FOMC members, that we've taken very rapid action to uh, bring those rules into conformity. And we are also uh, have put in place um, uh, uh, sort of ethics um, processes uh, at the reserve banks that will better catch those issues uh, sooner um, and lead to uh, self-identification and um, stronger compliance with those rules. So critically important, we understand that we serve the American public, that we have to build trust with the American public, and uh, that we had uh, some work to do um, following uh, those breaches. And, and we're very committed to continuing to strengthen the trust um, placed in the Federal Reserve. And I think that's across both our uh, rules, but also our policy making. So just staying on the issue of kind of the Fed's mandates for a bit, in August 2020, the Fed came out with a new framework. And I know you are very influential in including in that framework the phrase broad and inclusive, that that's the type of maximum employment that we want to see, not just one group driving that unemployment rate down, but that it's broad. And then, of course, we saw so many people lose their jobs in the pandemic. How difficult do you think it will be to stay with that broad and inclusive new mandate given that there's so much pressure on the Fed right now just to get inflation down? Yeah, so I think um, the focus on broad and inclusive um, employment um, is, is, is really core um, to our work. Um, and so if you look uh, right now at the recovery um, in employment, uh, what you'll see is that um, Unemployment is actually back around the level um, it, that uh, was in place uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, and employment outcomes uh, for demographic uh, groups, racial and ethnic groups, are actually quite similar to where they were pre-pandemic. And of course, they had improved um, for black workers and Hispanic workers in particular a great deal over the course of this very long recovery. Um, in terms of uh, going forward, you know, I'd like to continue to see uh, gains um, among those, those groups. Those disparities that we saw right prior to the pandemic are, again, evident today. Um, but again, that was after some really important improvement had taken place. You know, the other things that we're seeing um, is there was a lot of uh, people who left uh, leisure and hospitality, as I, as I noted earlier. The sort of in-person services um, arena continues to be an area where I think it's, it's harder to attract people back. Um, and early retirees is a huge new phenomenon. Um, you know, we're missing a very large number of people from the workforce that would have been projected to be working. So we're very focused on that. But our mandate, um, our, our framework, our approach um, is very much around uh, the uh, keeping inflation expectations anchored at 2%. And I think you've seen uh, that we've worked hard at that and that, in fact, inflation expectations have uh, been anchored. Very important. We stone very strong resolve um, to get inflation down. And I think we'll continue to take the necessary steps while also being very mindful of uh, the labor market. Do you think those early retirees will come back in any notable way? It's a debate last year. Yeah, I don't think I have um, any better um, insights uh, than you know most people. Um, it does seem to be somewhat correlated um, uh, among different demographic groups. So you see some of those early retirements being more concentrated among white workers and among college-educated workers. I don't know if that really tells us very much about whether they're likely to come back or not. Um, but certainly, you know, as we think about resolving imbalances, um, one of the important imbalances is uh, labor demand uh, and labor supply, particularly in some of those in-person uh, services areas. And so, you know, it would be great um, to see uh, a return of workers. Um, that, of course, would be the best outcome if we don't see that, um, obviously. You know, you need uh, restraint uh, on the demand side to bring demand into, uh, into you know, alignment with that reduced supply. Uh, 
When you look ahead to next year, would you be surprised if the Fed actually reverse course and cut rates at some point next year, as some people on Wall, on Wall Street think might happen? You know, I think um, what uh, we talked about um, in the last meeting, uh, which is um, taking into account the cumulative amount of tightening um, that is in place um, and uh, the lags with which um, tightening and financial conditions flows through to activity and to inflation, I think um, by moving at a more deliberate pace, we'll actually be able to see how um, that cumulative tightening is playing out and how much additional tightening. You know, as we get into restrictive territory or further into restrictive territory, risks become more two-sided. Um, and in that environment, it's uh, really valuable to be able to um, be able to take into account um, that the data as we go. And so that should um, enable us to move to a restrictive level that is appropriate for bringing inflation down over some period of time. And so exactly what that path looks like, I think, is really hard to say right now. But I think it will be um, very much um, you know, sort of uh, better at balancing those risks by virtue of being able to take on board more data. I want to leave some time for questions from the great group in the room, but I did want to ask you one question about the way you see your job. You've been vice chair since May, and obviously we're at the Fed through the pandemic. We saw so many people around the country and world change what they wanted from work, how they worked, like what they wanted to do for work over the course of the pandemic. How did the, pan how did the pandemic change you? Yeah, so look, I think um, you know, the pandemic um, brought a lot of um, tragedy and heart heartache um, to families and uh, workers around the country, really around the world. Um, and we're still seeing some of that, you know, both in terms of people's um, willingness to go back to some of the jobs that were so hard being on the front lines during the pandemic. You think about healthcare, you know, uh, in-person uh, services generally, those were really taxing and stressful jobs. Um, but the flip side of that is we also learned that we can do a tremendous number of things um, in a way that's enabled by technology remotely um, and effectively and productively. And so, you know, we did all of our operations remotely, which is a, you know, remarkable thing. I think if you had asked me six months beforehand, would that be something that you would feel confident about? I would have said, you know, absolutely not. But we were able to do that. And so with, you know, companies all, all over the world. So I think, you know, there is some, um, there is some uh, positive, uh, you know, sort of implications for the economy, it may take a while, um, but for people's ability to work in ways that they are more productive and you know, more satisfied, and also for the economy, I think, to be more productive and hopefully more resilient into the future. I mean, I think we, between the pandemic and the war, you know, there's probably some rethinking of um, cost savings versus resilience. Companies are reconfiguring supply chains to take those things into account, so I'm hopeful um, that some of these changes will actually lead to a, a more flexible um, economy uh, going forward. Great. Well, I do want to open it up to questions. Does anyone from the audience have one? Would you mind giving your name and affiliation when you ask the question, just so Vice Chair um, can know? Sure. Hi. Uh, Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. You mentioned the potential for catch-up hiring in areas like leisure and hospitality. Uh, and uh, there's also been plenty of anecdotes, I think, including in the Beige Book, about uh, potential labor hoarding if there is a slowdown. Do those two combine potentially to create more labor demand than you might want to see going forward, therefore perhaps more wage pressure, uh, even if the economy were to slow a bit? So, um, you know, the stories about catch-up hiring and labor hoarding, um, if you look at some of the recent um, hiring data, it does look actually like um, the strongest hiring has been in those catch-up areas. So it's really uh, a sectoral story rather than an aggregate demand overall story. You know, and if you, um, which of course, taking a look at um, wages, you know, if you look at the employment uh, compensation index, which is you know probably the broadest measure, um, 
it's stepped down um, quite a bit, actually, from about 6% in the first half of the year to about 4.3% in the third quarter. Um, and that is a similar kind of um, uh, movement that we've seen in average hourly earnings uh, there. I think it's stepped down from about 4.7 in the first half of the year to about um, 3.9 um, in the three months leading up to October. So, you know, that does suggest cooling uh, on aggregate um, and lessening wage pressures. And I think it's important to remember that um, wages have actually not kept up with inflation. Um, real incomes have actually, on aggregate, fallen, um, even though wages are higher uh, than what would be consistent with the run rate uh, associated with 2% inflation. So, so they're really um, in the middle there, and, and they are coming down. Great. Uh, Craig Torres from Bloomberg. I'll come, to you. I'll come to you next, Rachel. Uh, uh, Vice Chair, when inflation starts to fall uh, and if unemployment starts to rise, um, what kind of patients? Uh, inflation's a lagging indicator. Um, how much patience will you show to get inflation back to two? if it's trending around three, if the labor market is in distress? We have a 2% uh, inflation target, um, and that is what our monetary policy is designed um, to achieve, along with um, also a maximum employment objective. So, you know, as we, um, as we go forward, obviously risks are going to be more two-sided as we get into more restrictive or further into uh, restrictive territory. So uh, we'll be balancing those considerations. Um, but you know, we are um, very much uh, focused on achieving our 2% inflation goal. Um, it's very important to keep inflation expectations anchored around that goal. Uh, and so we'll just have to make judgments like that um, as we uh, go forward what is the appropriate level of restraint uh, on a sustained basis that's going to be necessary to, to, uh, to make that balance. Rachel, as promised to you. Thank you. Hi, Vice Chair Brainerd, Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. To follow up on what you were saying about lag effects, can you walk us through what that timeline looks like over the coming year? And if, when you talk about cumulative tightening, how much of that is just from the federal funds rate versus tightening from other central banks around the world, too? Yeah, so um, different people are going to think about those things differently. When I think about cumulative tightening, I really think about financial conditions, because it's financial conditions that transmit that to decision making uh, by firms uh, who might be borrowing or um, by households. Um, the cleanest um, read, perhaps, um, is on um, the Treasury yield curve. And if you uh, just look at that, essentially we've seen um, the entire curve uh, from 1 to 10 years move above 1% in real terms. So that's a big shift um, in a nine-month period. And that's uh, one way of thinking about cumulative tightening. And of course, that does take into account not only our actions here at home, but potential spillovers of financial uh, conditions abroad. In terms of thinking about um, lags, so there are a variety of different estimates um, that uh, the research uses different methodologies. So some uh, research methodologies leave you with you know, many quarters of uh, lags, and some suggest that that transmission is somewhat shorter um, and so you might be uh, thinking, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, two to three quarters rather than, you know, the longer um, estimates of lags that come from the historical literature. But even with that, um, that suggests that it takes some time for that cumulative tightening to really be visible. So if you think about the housing sector, for instance, you know, that's where we can see it right away, right? Residential investment has come down extremely rapidly in response to much higher interest rates. 
But if you think about some of the other decisions that households are making that are perhaps less interest rate sensitive, it may take quite a bit more time. And so it's really going to be, um, you know, a again, a exercise of watching the data carefully um, and trying to assess how much restraint uh, there is and how much additional restraint is going to be necessary and sustained for how long. And those are the kinds of judgments that, that lie ahead for us. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. This side of the room, Howard. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Thanks for, for, thanks for being here and taking the questions. Uh, with one exception, the Fed has turned, off, uh, turned, turned uh, on this record-setting uh, shift in monetary policy with only one dissent. And I'm wondering, do you think that's a strength of the system, that there hasn't been more sort of uh, public discussion about this, that the language is so fully aligned behind the, the, the statements of the, of, of the chair? Um, and how hard has that been to achieve? Well, I do think that um, there is very strong um, agreement among committee members on the need to show resolve the need to um, keep inflation expectations anchored at 2% and to stop high inflation from getting entrenched. And so I think that is uh, reflected in this really strong support for the rapid uh, cumulative tightening that has taken place so far. Again, of almost four percentage points of tightening in a period of about nine months at the same time that the balance sheet uh, is being uh, reduced. Um, but we do have, um, and I think this is really important, um, we do have very uh, full discussions among committee members, taking into account all the complicated judgment calls that we've been talking about here. How much restraint, for how long, how, what data do we look at, given that a lot of data is looking in the rearview mirror. So I think there's healthy discussions, and um, I do believe that it's going to be very important to have uh, those different perspectives informing our policy deliberations. I think we have time for just one last. Um, Ed? Yes, uh, you were talking about uh, rearview mirror data. And one thing in particular I was thinking about is housing. Because uh, when you think about real incomes, that's one of the places where people are very stressed over um, the, the price level changes. There's anecdotal evidence that price level changes in rentals are coming down, uh, but that's not necessarily reflected in the data that we see in CPI, for example. How do you look at that in terms of thinking about uh, going forward in terms of the lag of, of, of the effect of uh, monetary tightening? Yeah, so housing services is really important. Um, it's particularly important in CPI, but it's also important in uh, PCE inflation, and it's really important um, in terms of how much money uh, an average household spends each, money, each month on housing services. So it really is a big expenditure, usually the single biggest expenditure item for many households, and it's very salient. Um, in terms of the data, so um, the cumulative tightening that's taken place has really shown up in very large increases in mortgage rates in a very short period of time. You can see that reflected in house prices, uh, house prices across the country had been rising very rapidly. Most indicators now suggest that at best they're flattening out and in some cases actually falling. And of course, in some parts of the country, house prices are, are, are now falling. How does that translate into rental pricing? If you look at new rents on new leases, that's where I think you're referring to we're actually seeing those indices coming down. But for continuing leases, um, they may actually still be catching up to the market. And so what do we see in the inflation metrics? It's really the aggregate of different housing services. So we're tracking those subcomponents very closely because they'll give us a sense of when that component is likely to peak. And again, I would say you know, well into next year, um, taking into account those offsetting uh, forces, housing services in the inflation series isn't likely to peak until well into next year. So that's one of those persistent categories where continued restraint is going to be important to bring inflation down to 2% over time.